Hello, Secretary Sutters. It's good to see you. It's nice to be with you always. I'm just sorry that it's virtual and not in one another's presence. Soon, soon. We're looking forward to that. Um, well, today I want to talk a little bit about what you've been through during the course of the last year. Um, I'm certain that your perspective and your insights on what all of us have lived um, are really unique um, to the vantage point that you've had. Um, and of course, your vantage point is always pretty remarkable. Health and Human Services is the largest secretariat with a $24 billion budget, a workforce of 22,000 people. You, uh, you often remind us that you touch one in four people uh, through the services that your agencies offer. Um, Pre-pandemic, your agenda was pretty packed. Um, you were implementing major systems reforms at DCF, investing in prevention and treatment to tackle the opioid crisis, expanding community-based mental health services, integration, integrating primary care and behavioral health care. Um, and that's just to name a few. Yeah. But I'm thinking that COVID-19 might be one of the biggest challenges of your professional career. What in your background, both professionally and personally, prepared you for it? Well, thank you for that. And um, I think for like all of us a year ago, March, uh, life stopped as we knew it, um, right? Uh, we shut down things, the, the, the pandemic as it really started to surge very publicly in Massachusetts and across our country. I mean, life just stopped. Um, it didn't mean we didn't keep on living, but everything that we were used to doing, whether it was school, work, relationships, family, travel, um, the important social work that MSPCC does, everything literally just, just halted. And um, it was in those early days in March that as we started to see numbers tick up, we started to watch what was happening globally. We were trying to determine what we needed to do in Massachusetts with Governor Baker's leadership. Uh, he and I had a conversation about my sort of stepping up and over, if you would, to really advise him on the COVID response. Because unlike a natural disaster, right, this is a, this is a healthcare disaster. And so our normal response to how we deal with snowstorms and um, fires and right natural disasters uh, is different in this kind of circumstance. And so it required a different kind of response. Uh, where MEMA is always front and center, our, our Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency and their extraordinary public servants, right? They are, they are logistic, logistic operation machines. Um, and so MEMA is very much a part of the command center that I am the, the leader of. Uh, but it was it was really trying to define a healthcare and human services response to a pandemic that I think none of us really realized we would still be in a state of emergency a year later. Uh, and I think that's the lens I brought. I brought the healthcare experience as secretary, but also remembering of the human cost of this pandemic and then marshalling the resources that MEMA brings on the logistic management. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, we thought, Mary, quite honestly, that this was at the command center and would sunset uh, in last summer, and then maybe Labor Day, then we experienced, of course, a second surge. Uh, and the, our responses had to evolve as the nature of this pandemic has evolved. And I, I think, as a social worker, we're used to evolving circumstances and taking in very many di different perspectives. And I, you know, there was not one linear path to manage this pandemic. You know, I, I agree with you. And, and as I sat in the field um, and again, have not lived through anything like this, but certainly have gone through different crises. Um, I was struck as by how, um, how it wasn't incumbent upon us as providers to make the case why our staff, why the families, children we work with 
um, needed to be paid attention to. Um, and I I'm interested, you know, and when I think about your work as a social worker at the Department of Mental Health, as the Commission of the Department of Mental Health running MSPCC, how did those experiences, those people play into your decisions? Oh, um, you can never forget them. Uh, the, one of the hardest decisions, Mary, was uh, I remember when uh, we were trying to do everything possible to not have schools close, K through 12, um, early ed close. And I remember when Boston closed, that that signaled basically across the state, everything was going to close and how devastating that was at, because I understood that children, right? Schools are more than just education for our children. They provide structure, ability to learn uh, how, to how, to, how to play, right? How to share, how to, how to, how to form relationships with peers and with others. Uh, it is also a safe place for many children. And it is a place where, where schools are often right, the, our eyes and ears on kids who may start to experience troubles, both from you know, neglect or abuse, right? But it, it's an important lens for us as social workers in, the, in understanding the protection of children. So I remember not just the consequence for children with special needs, which has been devastating, I think, this past year, uh, of remote learning on children for whom sitting in front of a computer for anything more than a few minutes is, is really just not possible. Or for families, right, who can't afford, who couldn't afford or didn't have access to uh, Chromebooks and, and the internet in a reasonable way. Or I thought a lot about families who are in shelter, family shelters and the experience for their children. So as we, so I, I take that as a compliment and that I never forgot about um, the broad needs of families and individuals in the Commonwealth. Um, it, I felt the pain, honestly, of every decision we made to shut something down, what the consequence was, not just on our economy, which has been devastating, but on the lives uh, of families and children uh, who rely on many of these supports for more than like schools, more than just education. It also provides respite for parent, parents, quite honestly, uh, as well. But I think of the structure that schools provide for kids, the learning, right? The emotional capacity, the resilience of kids. So we, we those, those were some of the dark days Honestly, yeah. it was last March, but um, I think, as you know, what when we put out our supports, our financial supports in the spring, uh, you know, obviously protection of our healthcare system in a pandemic is paramount. But I was not going to forget the needs of human services workers, of congregate care programs that can't close, of residential schools for kids, you know, with special needs that you know. If those kids ended up in emergency rooms, we would then just have an additional crisis on our hands. So I tried to take a holistic view. I'm, I'm sure there's many out there will tell me what all the shortcomings uh, were of that time, but really did try to keep kids and families uh, and our economy at the heart of every decision we were making. Yes, yes. You, you mentioned um, when Boston shut down their schools. And um, as, you, as you know, in the last month, many of us have recalled that a year ago, we experienced our last normal week, although we certainly didn't know it at the time. Um, when you look back, you know, when did you realize everything was about to change? When schools closed. Yeah. It yeah. was, um, that was a marker that um, everything was shutting down. Um, it, uh, it was, I just, I just remember, it really wasn't Biogen. I mean, I think for a lot of people, Biogen was a marker. I think for Biogen, what, that, that, what Biogen reminded me of was that this was a global pandemic, 
Yes. So Biogen was a global pandemic. It's one thing to say you couldn't travel to the United States from China, but it wasn't, it was the travel coming in from all other ports, right? All other parts of the world. But it was when schools closed and 1.1 million kids were now home that I realized this, this just fundamentally changes everything for us. That was the marker for me. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, shifting a little bit, you know, as you know, adverse childhood experiences are closely linked to long-term problems um, and can also negatively impact education and job opportunities in the long run. Should we count the closure of schools as an adverse childhood event? And has the risk level for this entire generation of kids been raised in that way? So I don't know if I would like classically call it an adverse uh, event. I think we have a lot to make up for our kids um, for this past year. Um, and whether it is, you know, we're just starting the reopening process now, April 5th. You know, we, we've done some amazing things in Massachusetts to get our schools back open. I have this group of extraordinarily smart uh, folks who work for, with me who figured out the pooled testing. Uh, you know, we're the first state in the, in the union who figured out how to do pooled testing as a sur true surveillance for schools. And I can tell you the, the early data uh, is amazing, like 0.7% positive cases across um hundreds of schools will put you're get you're getting an early release of the data we're about to release it's amazing we're going to fund it through the end of the year right so pool testing we know schools what we what do we know about now a year later schools are not places of transmission kids are not getting sick right so schools actually have turned out to be a safe place for kids and some schools in Massachusetts, stayed open. Catholic schools, Catholic elementary schools. I was up at, we were up in Gloucester, 101 days of schools, closed twice. One, one was for a snowstorm. Uh, so schools, I think what we've learned is, as I think about the future, another pandemic, we probably can keep our kids in school with a whole bunch of protective measures, which I think is better for education, better for emotional, emotional development, and kids, the good news is kids are resilient, but I think for kids um, with challenges, special needs, and kids who just need to understand what did this past year mean, I think we need to really lean in and support them um, emotionally. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, I couldn't agree with you more. I've been saying it for quite some time now, kids should be in school. and. Uh, and have that husband who's been taking that surveillance testing too, doing just fine. Um, you know, you just alluded to it again, you know, but for the kids and, and adolescents who've been experiencing this pandemic, what exactly, what do you, well, not exactly, but when you think about what we need to do to support these kids as we transition them back to reopening our communities, what, what goes through your mind that we need to do that support the, the children and I guess the adults who also care for them? Well, as we know, the younger the child, right, the more dependent they are upon adults. So kids look to adults, right, to be safe, to understand the context of what they've experienced in something that makes sense to them. Uh, uh, so de de depending on where a child is developmentally, right, the, the response needs to be different. The, 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 what the only thing I can equate back to is it's very different is 9-11. When 9-11 happened, I was actually commissioner of mental health and I actually wrote a series of op-eds about helping your children put 9-11 in context. I remember at the time, like if a child is really, like children look to you, if you're anxious, they, they what, as we've always said, right? Mm -hmm. When, a child's in crisis, when a family's in crisis, the child's in crisis. Um, so adults, how do you speak about the pandemic to your children? What are the words you use that they can incorporate? Right? And be very intentional about how you speak about it, right? If you as an adult are fearful, you know if a child is gonna pick that up. 
not minimizing it, however, right? You can't dismiss this past year. And I think all of us are going to get used to wearing face coverings for quite a while. And, you know, kids are pretty resilient that way. Um, I was at a school for children with really severe special needs that never closed. And these are kids with, you know, on, on the, uh, with very intense um, uh, autism. And they were all wearing face coverings. On occasion, you had to remind them, but you know, they adapt. And these are kids with severe special needs. So I think kids, you know, who are essentially healthy, healthy young kids, I, I think they can adapt because we can make it cool for them. I think for kids who come, you know, with histories of, of abuse and neglect or, 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 you know, or the kids who sit quietly in the class, we're going to have to draw them out, right? We're going to have to validate what they're, what they're feeling, right? Not dismiss it and support them um, in their development. And I, I think it's gonna take time. I mean, yeah. for a lot of these kids, they've lost almost a year in learning. Yeah, yep. Um, two more quick questions, because I know sure. you're... Um, so what have you learned from this experience? And when you look back on the last 12 months, what are you most proud of? Well, I'll tell you what I'm grateful for is I'm grateful uh, for my family. Uh, and, and I'm very, you know, family is, we all know the importance of family. And my family really just completely understood from last March that. I was a non-presence in their lives for, for till this day, Inclu including Bradley, who as oh, many people who are, who have seen Bradley at MSPCC events has just with complete grace said, you just need to do what you need to do, um, working with the governor 24 uh, seven. That gave me tremendous, right? Uh, lessened my guilt and just allowed me the opportunity to just really work constantly. I think what I've learned is how grateful I am to be in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, our healthcare system was stressed a couple of times and strained. It was never overwhelmed. And our healthcare system completely operated as one system. It never, it, the competitiveness of the, the of, you know, of us uh, in normal times just completely went aside and people just stepped in and operated as one system. Our human service providers, right? Everyone just leaned in. Whatever it is it takes to get it done, right? People just, what can I do to help? The sense of people reaching out, whether it was in your neighborhood, your uh, your, to your neighbors or in a more collective sense, the spirit, that spirit of just leaning in and working together was, I think, what I'm proudest of. Uh, you know, we, we've been honest, you know, we've tried some things that work, we, some other things that, you know, you say, okay, well, that didn't really work. And you just move on in that can-do attitude and spirit, I think is, if I'm proud of anything, it's it's that we we will prevail. We will prevail through this. There's been extraordinary loss for many people, whether it's the connections, right? Grandparents hugging their grandchildren, death in our long-term care facilities. Uh, and we will learn from all of this in Massachusetts. And in the event that we ever have another pandemic, we will be uh, so much more prepared for it. And it's my hope that for our kids, that we can find the pathway to keep schools open, to allow them to continue to be kids, to be safe and protected, uh, because uh, they are our future, as you and I have always said. Madam Secretary, one thing I will say, um, you didn't know it for the first four years, but I do think that the the tone of respect and partnership that both you and Governor Baker established with human services, as well as you know the healthcare industry, 
um, paid off during this pandemic because you guys had the credibility to be able to one, you knew who the players were and be able to work with them in a really meaningful way. So, you know, we were fortunate that those, that foundation was there when the crisis, when the crisis occurred. One last question. What are you most looking forward to once it's safe to leave our COVID pods? I, I, I'm looking, so if, if I can eradicate the word Zoom from my <laughs> vocabulary, that will be, that will be, uh, that will be a joyful day. Uh, but I say that um, I look forward to just being in the in present with people again. I miss I miss being with people to just have those conversations, the informal conversations, the being over the state house is completely empty. It, it just feels like it's a, a closed building. Uh, not that I'm looking forward to legislative hearings, but just you know that just the 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 company of people, right? Yeah, it is what I I look forward to. Of uh, just really, uh, I I have practiced very tight bubble fidelity, uh, so I am looking forward to my vaccination on the end of the month. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and but really just being being together again, right? Uh, that's what I really miss the most is um, is the presence of people and never having to use the word Zoom again, except. You know, yes. In the context of which zooming was really meant to be. <laughs> exactly. I'm with you. I, I'm. I'll be. I'll be really happy to say goodbye to it, and really, really grateful when I can see you and others in person. Me too. Me too, yeah. my friend. But to you and my my friends at MSPCC, uh, I'm just grateful for what you do each and every day to support the needs of children and families and really focusing on protecting kids and um, supporting families. So from my heart to yours and to you through the board and all the staff, thank you for what you do. Take care. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Enjoy your afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Bye.